lecture number 15 to the wireless uh, communications lab. And so today, uh, what we're going to do is talk about carrier frequency offset. And so at first, we'll explain the origin of frequency offset and discuss, you know, what kind of impairment it creates, why it's challenging to deal with. And then we will look at a particular technique for cor correcting frequency offset using a periodic training. And so I'm going to review a technique that's generally called the Moose method for joint frequency offset estimation. And as a bonus, you get a frame synchronization uh, algorithm with it as well. And then we will extend that to uh, work with uh, OFDM system. And the essential innovation here will be that we'll still use a periodic uh, sequence, but we'll also use uh, some additional structure to get better correction range. All right, so let's start off with the origin of frequency offset, what it means here. Okay, so we start off with um, something that we reviewed many lectures ago, this whole passband and baseband representation. So consider a passband signal. And let's talk about the signal that we are going to uh, pass to the receiver here. So let's call that YP of T, which is equal to the real part of Y of T, e to the minus j, 2 pi, fc of t here. And so we, we know that if we've got a passband signal, it's sitting around some carrier frequency that we can write it in this fashion here, where y of t is the complex baseband equivalent, and f sub c here, that's the carrier frequency there. Now, the, the main question at hand here is that you know, suppose that you don't know the carrier frequency exactly at the receiver. Suppose that you only have some estimate of the carrier frequency, FC hat, at the receiver. And this is very practical because, you know, we have to generate this carrier using practical circuit components, and we can never generate, you know, a perfect carrier. There's always going to be some, some sort of an offset. And there's generally a trade-off between the amount of money that you spend on a circuit and the resulting quality of your, of, of the sinusoidal carrier that you can generate here. So what's going to happen is that the carrier at the receiver is never going to be identical to the carrier that we have at the transmitter there. And, and they're going to be very close. They might differ by, um, you know, 20 parts per million. But even that is enough to create an offset that will um, cause us to not be able to demodulate the received signal. So to look at that here, let's look at, first of all, you know, what, what does this create here? So this creates... what's called the carrier frequency offset. And you see this abbreviated a lot of times as CFO, not chief financial officer. And um, correcting for the carrier frequency offset is usually known as carrier synchronization. And carrier synchronization in the old days was done, you know, primarily in analog. And now it might be either a mixture of analog and digital or primarily digitally driven. So what I mean is that you, you may have uh, some correction mechanism in analog so you can, you can adjust to the, um, the frequency that you're generating. And you can do that using decisions based on analog or digital. 
or you can just have complete digital correction. So generally, if the offset is small, you can correct everything in digital. And for a larger offset, you might need to actually adjust the analog components here, which would be done using some kind of control signaling between the analog and digital circuits. So um, from a signal processing perspective, what we really need to know is what is the model for a carrier frequency offset estimation? You know, so once we have the model, then we can start to devise algorithms for fixing it here. So without going through like the derivation of the model here, I'll give you the equivalent model here. So assuming that the offset is small, and the front end bandwidth is sufficiently wide. So this, um, both of these assumptions here, I mean, if you look at this right here, what's going to happen is, at the receiver, we're going to take this YPFT, and we're going to multiply it by the cosine 2 pi FC hat of T. So if the FC hat and the FC were very different, you know, you could end up shifting the signal completely into a different band and just filtering out and completely missing it. So the offset has to be reasonably close so that you're, you don't filter the signal away when you're doing the process of down conversion here. Now assuming that's the case, and then let me, I guess let me just draw here what the receiver, what I'm talking about here for giving you this, this signal model here. So essentially what I'm saying is that the received signal is going to be processed as if the FC hat here was the true one. And then if you remember the, the subsequent parts of this receiver here, so we multiplied through by this here, we had an arbitrary low-pass filter here. You know, gain of two somewhere, that doesn't really matter, but stick it in anyway here. You know, and then this, this gave us essentially the real part of YFT. And then this would be imaginary part of YFT. And then the problem is that this is not FC here. And so then the correction mechanisms I mentioned, I mean, if, if you had some knowledge of what FC hat would be, you could possibly change how the FC hat here is generated. Otherwise, you're stuck with correcting everything in digital after the sampling. And so we're going to focus on digital correction in this class. So the model here, it turns out, is um, relatively simple, and it looks like as follows here. So the sampled models, this is after the match filtering and the sampling, looks something like this here. Y of n equals e to the j, 2 pi, epsilon n, sum from l equals 0 to l, h of l, s of n minus l, plus noise here where epsilon is equal to Fe times the symbol period T, and Fe is equal to the difference between our true frequency offset and our estimated version here, or what we assume known to be true at the receiver here. Now, for purposes of explanation here, I'm assuming what the transmitter generates is, is the perfect carrier, and what the receiver estimate is this FC hat. But of course, you know, if you have an, an error in either one, it doesn't matter. We're just going to lump it into the, the hat term here, right? So the transmitter doesn't generate a perfect carrier either. We're just taking that one to be our, our true carrier. So this is derived under, um, under some assumptions, essentially, that you have to have a small offset and enough bandwidth. And there's a couple other um, small details in the derivation, but it, essentially you get something that looks like this here. Now, the operative difference between what we've had before and what we have now is this term right here. So 
So think for a second here what's happening here. So here is a convolution with our um, transmitted symbols convolved by our, our propagation channel impulse response. But these samples of that convolution are multiplied by e to the j 2 pi epsilon n. So effectively, they're being rotated in the complex um, plane, and they're being rotated every sample by a factor 2 pi epsilon. So when you start looking at sample 0, everything is good. You start looking at sample 100 or sample 1,000, there starts to be a significant amount of rotation. It all depends on how big that epsilon is. So if that epsilon is big, the rotation very quickly um, overwhelms everything that you might want to do at the receiver here. Notice also that this, this, doesn't, this whole thing doesn't really have any effect on the noise, which makes sense because noise is really just coming in. Um, it, it's an additive phenomenon, so if we you know, demodulate the receive signal at a slightly different carrier, it's irrelevant because the noise is flat. So just, just, uh, just, that's not a function of the offset here. Now, the, the problem here is that so this rotation occurs after the convolution. So what I mean is that you have the, uh, the whole effects of this combined convolution, the channel, the impulse responses of the, the transmitter, the, the receiver, the match filter, all of that here. And effectively, this rotation occurs after that operation. So it means that um, the information that we send, for example, training here, is smeared by the channel. And it's also rotated by the offset here. So if we don't know the channel, you know, it, it's much harder to estimate the offset and then figure out the offset and the channel. So you have to know the offset to get the channel. But if you don't know the channel, how do you get the offset? Because you have these two unknowns here. One is multiplicative and one is convolutive. So it's, it, it's, it's a really insidious um, degradation. And unfortunately, the with this, the values of epsilon that we see. See, so notice here that this is an offset. This is a difference multiplied by the symbol period here. So even though this, this right here may be on the order of um, hundreds of hertz, that's all we're talking about here. You could have a 2 gigahertz carrier, and this offset could be just hundreds of hertz. But when you multiply that out by this, the symbol period, then you end up with an epsilon that's, that's not too small. So that makes it um, you know, very tricky here to deal with here. And so that impacts you know, pretty much every aspect of the receiver here, including channel estimation and equalization. Now, just uh, for some additional intuition, let's look at the special case where there's flat fading channel. So in the flat fading channel, we have L equals 0. And so we might write something like this here, y of n equals e to the j 2 pi epsilon n h s of n plus v of n. So um, what you can see here is that all you're doing is your transmitted symbols get rotated and scaled by the channel. That's fixed, but presumably you know that, well, ideally. And then this comes along and rotates every sample successively here. You know, so if your rotated and shifted constellation looked like this, then over time, that effective constellation would be shifting. as a function of 2j pi epsilon n. And you can see that as it shifts, after it shifts for a while, effectively your decision boundaries would be violated and you just get complete error. And so, um, you know, longer block length creates a more severe error here. So that's the, um, the effects of this offset here. Now fortunately, the way that the offset impacts our received signal being right here does make correction easy. So what hopefully you can see here is that what we can do at the receiver is, without me trying to redraw the whole receiver block diagram, if we have a downsampling by M, after the downsampler, 
we can have an e to the minus j 2 pi epsilon n here. Well, I'm going to put a little hat there. That's our estimate. And then we can continue on here. So this can be like our carrier frequency offset estimator. Here. So, you know, correcting for this just simply involves multiplying by e to the minus j 2 pi epsilon n. So the correction is relatively easy, but the challenge is going to be estimating the parameter of epsilon given that we don't know this, this impulse response here. And this being the more interesting practical scenario because uh, most of the time our channel bandwidths are wide and we have uh, frequency selective fading. So that's the challenge here. So now we're going to talk about correction. Any questions just about the, the system model, the problem, or its potential solution? Well, it's all a function of how the bandwidth of essentially the amount of oversampling that you have. So it really just depends on, on the way the receiver is designed, right? But if you have like a lot of filtering and you filter your receive signal so that you focus on, let's say, just the 20 megahertz bandwidth where your signal lives, and you want to do that because you want to get rid of noise. So even if you have a lot of oversampling, you still want to hit your receive signal with a reasonably band-limited low-pass filter because you don't want to get all that extra noise in there. But if you do that, now if you're, you receive signal, the carrier frequency offset's 10, 10 megahertz. Well, your receive signal is now between, instead of being between minus 10 and 10, it's between 0 and 20. And so you end up with half of it gone after that filter. So you have to have, you know, enough um, filtering so that your receive signal, you know, doesn't just get cut out. And so the, there's no way to correct for that digitally. Once you, in analog, you know, cut out half of your receive signal, you're kind of hosed there. So what you need to do is you would need to actually force the oscillator to, you know, shift the signal back into the, that band there. Um, that, that's essentially the intuition here. But, you know, most systems are designed so that you don't really need much analog correction. You primarily just use the digital correction because you can get an oscillator that's pretty good. There's only a few, few hundreds of hertz off. What I'm telling you about is a case where it's off by like megahertz, which would just be a horrible, horrible oscillator. But I suppose there's cases where that's of interest. Does that make any sense? You're on video, keep in mind. Yes, okay, you're acknowledging it makes sense. All right, any other questions? I mean, really, the, to, to me, the, the question that I always have and the question you really should be asking is how, is how we got this, this beautifully simplified model here. And the answer is there's not, a, there's not an easy derivation um, for it, but it's, it's essentially comes out because the offset is small. So there's a little approximation involved in there somewhere. And so actually this whole model here wouldn't even be practical if I, if I had like a megahertz offset. We'd have to have a different model here too. All right, any other questions here? All right, so let's go through the first um, correction technique. So this is going to be so frequency offset estimation using periodic training. So you should be able to use the Moose method to perform joint frequency offset estimation and frame synchronization. Because what we're going to do right now is we're going to solve the other problem that we had too, which is knowing where the frame starts. We didn't talk about frame synchronization when we had a multipath channel. We only talked about a flat channel. So we're now we're going, to, we're going to come up with an algorithm that actually tells us where our symbols start and the offset at the same time, which is amazing because we get two things with one algorithm. And further, we're solving something that's very hard. So the, the uh, idea here, and so th this is just a beautiful signal processing trick, essentially.
and it's going to leverage this idea of a periodic training sequence. I should be clear that when I'm talking about trick here, I, I don't mean something like scheme, something that's like deceitful. Um, I just mean something that's 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 like really cool, actually, more like a magic trick rather than you know someone tricking you out of all of your money in your wallet. Just suppose there's some overlap depending on where you're seeing that magic trick. If you're seeing it on the street corner, the guy playing cards and looking for a ball into the cards, maybe it's the latter here. Um, but this is really like a cool idea that. Uh, can be used essentially to deal with this problem here. So first of all, um, I guess just a little bit of credit here. I mean, the, the original reference on this is this paper by P. H. Moose uh, from Transactions on Communications in 1994. So I encourage you to check out that original reference. Um, and he actually describes it in the context of an OFDM system. But I'm going to tell you about it in the context of uh, just a standard single carrier system. And we'll extend it to OFDM in the latter part of the lecture here. Uh, so the idea is that we're going to consider a modification of the frame structure that we've looked at so far. So, so far, like for the single carrier setup, our assumption was that there was going to be training and then data. So now we're going to look at a block that still has data, but it's got two training sequences here that are identical. So there's a training here, there's another training here, and then there's our data here. So let's say this is total block length of n. This would be, uh, we can just call this here n. Actually, let me check the, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter here. All right, so we call that n here. And so we have two times nt symbols here for training. And then n symbols of data. Or you can make this n minus 2 nt, which, which I also do sometimes in the notes here. So that's the main difference here. We're just taking a training sequence and repeating it twice. Now, you know, you could use a shorter training sequence and repeat it twice. That's fine. So that's the, the structure here. Now let's see why that actually makes any sense at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to, first of all, you know, write the receive signal here. So our receive signals, y of n, e to j, 2 pi, epsilon n, sum from l equals 0 to l, h of l, s of n minus l, plus noise here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to suppose that, um, you know, with our structure here that s of n is equal to some known training sequence for n equal to 0 through nt minus 1. And again, S of n plus nt equals t of n for n equals 0 through nt minus 1. So this is S of n as these symbols here. S of n plus nt would correspond to these symbols here. Now, what we need to do to make this whole thing work here is we need to look at the output here. That's only a function of what we know. So we're going we're gonna to use that same trick when we were trying to write out um, the set of equations to perform channel estimation. We tried to get rid of the contributions from the symbols that are unknown, basically getting rid of that edge effect. So we're going to do that here, but we're going to do something like more particular than that, which is that we're going to focus on, on what is known you know, inside each of these different periodic training intervals here. So let's focus here on the first one. So looking at the first one, we can say that um, let's say here, so y of n, this right here is true, is equal to the e to the j, 2 pi, epsilon n, sum from l equals 0 to l, h of l, and I can put here t of n minus l plus v of n for n equal to 0, sorry, n equal to l through nt minus 1 here. 
by starting at L here, I'm getting rid of that little edge effect here. So that's why I'm starting at L instead of 0. Now, um, because this training sequence here is periodic, if I look also at y of n plus nt, I get e to the j, 2 pi, epsilon. Now notice here I have n plus nt, so I have to put the n plus nt up here. n plus nt, sum from l equals 0 to l, h of l, s of n plus nt minus l. And if I focus on this for n equal to l dot 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 through nt minus 1, then I can rewrite that as e to the j 2 pi epsilon nt, e to the j 2 pi epsilon n, sum from l equals 0 to l, h of l, t of n minus l, plus v of n. So look at these two terms here. I mean, this is the, the frequency offset, the impulse response, our known training, unknown noise. I should put the and sorry, I should put the NT over here. I forgot the noise over here. So what we end up with here is some sort of a this is e to the j 2 pi epsilon nt. This is a constant term times e to the j 2 pi epsilon n sum over l equals 0 to l, h of l, t of n minus l, plus some different noise here. So if we look at these two equations here, this piece right here is the same as this piece here. And so what we see on the second training sequence is that the output corresponds to the first training sequence plus the whole thing is shifted by a constant phase shift. That's a function of nt, the length of the training. Now, of course, the noise is different. But you can imagine that if you did this over many samples that we could somehow average out the noise. So this is essentially the... The idea now is that we're going to say, ah, look, this is essentially equal to e to the j 2 pi epsilon nt times y of n. So we're going to say, ah, you know, if I look at that same received signal later, it looks just like the first received signal except for one constant phase offset difference. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to formulate an estimator that exploits this fact that this is approximately equal to this here. And we have to be a little bit careful here because the, the temptation is essentially to do least squares, right? I mean, that's pretty much the only estimator we've talked about in class. So that's basically what you can imagine here. Now, the problem is that our unknown parameter is sitting here on the exponent. So this is actually not a standard um, linear least squares type problem. If you wanted to really solve this correctly, you'd have to use a structured least squares, nonlinear least squares type of estimator, which we haven't done, and we're not going to do. So what we're going to do is, is a trick, which is called, um, essentially, is relaxation. So what's that? Well, that's why I have the approximation there, because of the noise. If I'd had no noise, it would be exact. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a um, relaxed least squares problem, where instead of solving for that exponent here, we're going to write a least squares problem that looks at, you know, supposing that instead of having a complex exponential, we just have some complex number here. And we're going to sum over some through NTL, NT minus 1, Y of N plus NT minus A, Y of N squared here. And so this is where they're relaxing this here. So we're relaxing E to the J 2 pi epsilon NT into A. 
that we solve an easier problem at the expense of getting a, an answer that's not um, necessarily going to be the best answer that we could get here. <clears throat> and you know, essentially, at this point, um, we did this already when we talked about frequency flat channels. And so the estimate here, a hat, is going to be equal to the sum from L equals L to NT minus 1, Y star of N plus NT, Y of N, divided by the sum from L equal capital L to NT minus 1 of Y of N plus NT magnitude squared here. Now, at this point here, so if we want a, a simple frequency offset estimator, what we're going to do is we're going to suppose that our estimate is, um, is approximately something that looks like this here, to e to the j 2 pi epsilon of nt. And so then we're going to say that the phase of this A corresponds to our unknown phase here. And so then the A, the epsilon hat, is going to be equal to the phase of this, which I'll use this term arg for the phase. Now, notice that this is just a real number down here, so the phase of that's irrelevant. It's just um, zero. So it's a positive number. So all we care about is the numerator. And so we're going to look at the phase of y star n plus nt, y of n, which is just a correlation. And then we're going to divide by 2 pi times nt. Now, if you wanted to have this in terms of hertz, all we have to do is divide by the sample period. So you could also get that this offset error is equal to arg of sum of L equal L nt minus 1, y star n plus nt, y of n, divided by 2 pi nt times capital T here. So this is effectively our, our frequency offset uh, estimator here. So this is what we're proposing to use, and this is what's done in the, the Moose algorithm here. So this is the Moose estimate here. So to kind of to recap here, so we have the periodic structure, and we exploit that even though we still don't know the channel. We have not estimated the channel at all. Don't know the channel. But we know that the output here after the, at the receiver looks a lot like the output here, and so on. So we exploit the similarity to estimate, to write that the received signal at nt away looks like the received signal at y of n multiplied by some unknown phase. And then we post and solved an optimization problem and proposed to use this following solution here as our estimate here. And again, the important thing to note is that this is y here. This is not our training. Is not the training data. So we haven't actually exploited knowledge of the training. We're only exploiting the fact that the training has been repeated. That's all. It's the only thing we've exploited here. So this is a self-correlation. Um, so we take the received signal and correlate piece of it with itself. And based on the phase of that self-correlation, we get the frequency offset estimate here. Now, a couple points are in order here. I mean, one is that this only works for small offsets, right? The reason is that, you know, th this phase operator here is only going to give me a phase between, um, you know, basically minus pi and pi. I mean, you can't, you can't get multiples of 2 pi here because they just wrap around, right? So effectively, the um, maximum offset is corresponds to this 
epsilon of nt, absolute value being less than or equal to one half, which means that the maximum offset that you can correct is one over two nt here. You know, and equivalently in terms of the uh, continuous time carrier would be two nt times t here. So this is the main one you should keep in mind here. And so what we see is that there's, there's sort of an interesting trade-off happening here. So if you have a long nt, you can't correct a very big offset. But why would you want a large value of nt? So as nt gets long, the correction range decreases. But why would I want to do that? Why not have an nt of 1? Just use one symbol to do this. Well, I can't do that because we have a cyclic prefix. But we could, this, this length of L. But we could take L plus 1 and have one sample. So why don't we want to have just one sample here? Why would we want to have a sum over samples? Well, we're not estimating the channel yet, but you're, you're almost there, which is essentially the, um, that the reason this approximation here is because of the noise. So there's different noise on each of these pieces here. So intuitively, the more summing we have, we're going to be averaging over the effects of noise. And so we're making a trade-off here. The correction range decreases, but... Um, we get better noise averaging. So there's some kind of a trade-off that you would have to solve, you know, in a, in a given system design problem, probably looking at simulations with different parameters of interest. We can solve this in some cases using uh, some closed form analytical solutions. But essentially, you'd want you know, an NT that's not too big. So just enough to get some noise averaging, but not too much, because you want to allow yourself to correct a reasonable amount of frequency offset. Now, as an example, let's consider, um, you know, some, some sort of a real parameter here. So suppose we had a carrier frequency of 2 gigahertz and a 1 mega symbol per second QAM sequence and an NT equal to 10 here. So to determine the maximum FE that we could correct, we would just plug into that equation and we would get that this is 1 over 2 times 10 times, this is going to be 10 to the, well, it should be 10 to the 5, no, 10 to the 6, 1 mega symbol, be 1 times 10 to 6, 10 to 6 here. Minus 6. And so then that's going to be equal to 1 half times 10 to the 5th, which is, 50 kilohertz here. So this is the maximum offset that we could tolerate here. So that your transmitter could be 2 gigahertz, your receiver could be 2 gigahertz, we'll see 2.00005 gigahertz, and it would be okay. Now notice that the carrier frequency doesn't directly come in this calculation. This actually is not a function of the carrier. It's only a function of the difference between the two carriers here. Now, if you want to come up with a maximum epsilon offset, well, that would just be equal to 1 over 2 times 10, which would be equal to 1 20th. So in terms of um, discrete time, we can correct 1 20th of a... Well, it's not hertz, it's unitless. Here. Yeah. 
And so then if I increase this to 100, my maximum offset would go from 50 kilohertz to 5 kilohertz, and this maximum epsilon would go from 120th to 1 200th. Okay, so the final thing is, where do we get the frame synchronization from? Well, frame synchronization actually comes from this right here. Because what should happen here is that the beginning of your frame occurs where a piece of the frame looks just like a piece of the frame NT samples later. This is basically a correlation here. So a frame synchronization algorithm comes for free, which is essentially you correlate this signal with itself, look for the peak. Now, for the frame sync, we don't want to discard this here because um, there is actually some value in the normalizing by received energy here. So for frame sync, I'm going to call this here self-referenced frame synchronization. What we'll do is we'll solve some sort of a problem that looks like arg max sum from L equals zero, sorry, L equal capital L to NT minus one, Y star of N plus NT plus D, Y of N plus D here. And so we'll look at this correlation here. Maybe we'll look at the um, the peak value here. And then we can normalize in the bottom here by nt minus 1, y star of n plus nt plus d squared here. So essentially, you just correlate pieces of the signal with itself until you find a little peak. Now, one thing I do want to note here is that um, you, you can actually make this a little bit more robust by doing something slightly different here. In particular, uh, what you can do is, um, and these are just other algorithms that have been proposed, but a slightly more robust technique might look like this here. Something like that here where instead of just normalizing by the second samples squared, we actually multiply by the product of the second samples and the first samples here. Uh, the reason we do this is that when you're doing the frame synchronization, you could also be self-correlating in places where there's no signal or where there's a little bit of zero here. And so in this way, um, we're, we're kind of getting rid of the the amplitude differences that may happen here. So trying to normalize those amplitude differences out. And so in this way, you can still do the frame synchronization where the y's might be very small because you're going to effectively normalize it out and get some constant number here. And so there's variations of this as well here. But that's essentially the idea here. So, you know, what, why I like the, the moose technique so much, I mean, this is just, you know, I think, it's, I think it's very creative to think about this instead of just the brute force approach would be we could actually formulate a least squares problem here and try to solve it. You find that the linear least squares doesn't work very well because of this offset here. So you could solve a nonlinear least squares type problem, and there's an iterative solution. So there's other mathematically complicated ways to solve it. But they would pretty much involve, okay, hypothesize a certain epsilon, solve, solve for the best channel estimate, see the error. Hypothesize another epsilon, solve for the channel. So it would essentially involve a little search over little tiny epsilons. And, and that actually can work very well, but it, it's uh, much, much more complicated. So this is just a really cool idea of of solving this problem without needing the, the channel first. So that's, that's why I like this here. Um, there are generalizations of this all over the place. And, and I have a few in the homeworks 
but there's generalizations to multiple repetitions here. You know, why, why just have two? Why not have four? Um, in 802.11, they use a repetitive structure, like in 11a, they use variation of this in 11n. They use a structure that has uh, essentially 10 repetitions and then two. And so they have what's called like a short training and a long training. And they have 10 repetitions of this short training sequence here. And the short training, what it lets you do is it lets you average over, so instead of summing over here, we would, we would have multiple self-correlations that we could average over. So you can average over the noise, and yet you still maintain a small NT, which means a large correction range. And then you can go through and get a better estimate from the larger one here. There's other variations with sign flips. There's variations with cyclic prefixes, um, guard zones, time reversals. There's like a whole bunch of really cool algorithms that, that extend up this approach here. As well as there's work on deriving the optimum estimator. You know, so, so if you had like two sets of training here, how would you optimally combine all these observations to minimize the error? So there's like work on that too. All right, questions on the Moose algorithm. No questions on the Moose algorithm. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, I mean, first of all, the, the question is, where does the offset come from? So if you already have the hardware components together, you can use the spec sheet to determine um, what the F hat E would be. So essentially, you know, this is like the, based on my oscillator, this is how much offset I should expect, right? So then given that F hat, then you can solve for the value of NT that you need here. So that's, that's one way to go here. Now, assuming that you have a very good oscillator and then you could have a potentially a smaller value of NT, a small value of NT, then you could start to say, you know, if I have a really, really small value of NT, I don't get enough averaging, so I might want to make it bigger. And so for that, to think about it a little bit more exactly how to do that, um, it's possible to do it in some simple case analytically. It's just that in real systems, the, the modulation and coding is such that it's hard to predict the performance. So I'm, outside of simulation, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good approach here. There's probably some way to do it here. I can't think of a good approach right now. But if I can think of one, I can put it on the homework. It's good. I, I like these kinds of questions that lead to good homework problems. So other questions? Well, the data rate comes in in um, because it comes in right here. So, in fact, the data rate is, is maybe the most important part here, not even so much the carrier. So it just sort of depends. I mean, if you get the, if the carrier, yes, yeah, so if you get a, from the hardware a certain offset here, you have to divide by the, the symbol period and then get your NT. So it does, it does factor in there. Okay, so as a, let's see, where's my piece of paper here? Yeah. All right, so let's take a short break here.
Good. I'm trying to remember my password. It's always good here. Good to check on the uh, news here. Let's see. What to put here? Um, yeah. Nine to ten fifteen. Yes. Okay. <laughs> no idea what that is here. Hmm. have a good uh, picture of this here, but um, essentially I want to tell you about a uh, grant that we just received here at UT that involves the um, Wireless Networking and Communications Group, uh, which has many faculty, including myself, in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and the Center for Transportation Research, which is a center that's in civil engineering, of all places, that focuses on transportation. And so this is a Pretty cool uh, project that's going to involve, um, in this point, $1.4 million of federal money to support um, this, what we call Data Supported Transportation Operations and Planning Center, DSTOP. The, the civil people are good at coming up with names, so they came up with that, that name there. Um, and by the way, this $1.4 million in federal money seems like a huge amount of money, but uh, <laughs> remember, it doesn't go into faculty salaries pockets. It goes into, you know, paying students and staff. So this is not uh, 1.4 million for me. It's actually much, 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 much less than that. Um, but I think this is, a, this is a pretty cool project. It's interdisciplinary, so it's involving the wireless group looking at how wireless com communications can be used to help uh, transportation systems. You know, so for example, um, Big problem right now in transportation is congestion. You know, it's one of the one of the main issues in transportation systems. Th there are others like safety, but so congestion, um, traffic planning is hampered by not knowing the volume of traffic on particular roads. You know, we, we know this on on highways. They have cameras, and um, you know, you can see like on highway systems. Okay, you know, I thirty five is blocked. Mopac is backed up right now, but not on, not on a lot of the side streets. And so then, you know, there's there's software approaches here. I mean, everyone here has a smartphone. You should, in principle, be able to derive some data about, you know, if traffic is moving or not based on people's phones in their cars, if they're static or not. Um, and so that's one of one of the ideas here is to use that information. But really, we want to try to use more information than that. Information you could derive from vehicular area networks, vehicle to infrastructure networks. So information that the cars could be deriving from other cars and transmitting that back and then using that to, for example, control traffic lights in the, uh, you know, in the city to help, you know, get rid of some congestion. Uh, and so there's other aspects of this as well. There's involved with, um, with safety, you know, making transportation safer, uh, reducing collisions. Um, so this is going to be an exciting project. And, and this actually is for, for one year, but the hope is that this will actually continue uh, for several years, you know, and so we'll see people that hopefully some people in this class will perhaps end up working on projects related to transportation in the future. So any comments, questions on this here? Oh yeah, look, I have a nice quote here, yes. So NCG and CTR are uniquely positioned to advance the frontiers of transportation with the marriage of deep expertise in wireless communications offered by the WNCG and the nearly 50 year history of transportation research in CTR. It takes a while to get such a quote. <laughs> it's not a matter of having a conversation and providing a quote, apparently. Any comments, questions about this? Transportation? Wireless and transportation? There's actually a Wi-Fi standard that works for vehicle-to-vehicle um, -vehicle communications, 802.11p, and that uses um, an OFDM waveform. And it actually uses this periodic structure and a moose estimation algorithm, for example. So 
The stuff we're learning is not um, irrelevant at all. It's actually used in all of these different kinds of networks. And it's actually very hard there because you have a Doppler shift as well, because you have mobility of things. And so that Doppler adds an additional term in the offset because you, know, you have Doppler shift when ve you know, two vehicles are moving. And even though that seems like a very small number, remember the, the numbers we're talking about here are small. And so that small Doppler shift creates a big enough offset that we have to estimate incorrect for it. So you can use the Moose algorithm for that. All right, that here, I guess we'll continue back to the lecture here. No discussion here. I get the impression several people in this class had a hard Sunday evening because there's a lot of droopy eyelids. Maybe I can bring some soothing music in on Wednesday and we can all just sleep for the whole time. So um, now we're going to talk about how do we extend this Moose idea into an OFDM system. And again, the, the extension is extension in terms of methodology, because Moose actually was proposed for OFDM. But I'm going to explain to you how, how to do this here, and so you should be able to derive and implement this for OFDM, and so you actually will do that uh, in the last lab. All right, so let's look at um, frequency offset in an OFDM system. Okay, so, so essentially, um, you can use exactly the same idea. So what I'm going to show you, though, is a tricky way to create periodicity here. Now, this is very important because it turns out that OFDM is very sensitive to frequency offset. More so, relatively speaking, than a single carrier system uh, there's different ways to think about this, but intuitively, remember that with OFDM, we communicate using a large block of samples. And so if we have a large block of samples, the maximum offset is a function of the length of that block. And so um, it's not the sample period T, it's actually the number of subcarriers times the sample period T that kind of determines the extent of the offset. So, so whenever you do this block-based processing, uh, frequency offset becomes even more important. And also with OFDM, you know, we have this idea that we're communicating on subcarriers. And you can imagine if there's a little bit of offset, we shift our subcarriers all over the place. So, so frequency offset is one of the bigger issues with OFDM. And, and so therefore, you know, we need good strategies to fix it here. So what we're going to do is we're just going to look at um, a modification of the Moose method uh, by Cox and Schmidl, this Cox and Schmidl approach. So the Moose technique applies to OFDM and uses periodicity. So there's going to be an additional correction step that's introduced by Schmidl and Cox, Cox and Schmidl. Should technically be Schmidl and Cox, but Cox is the more famous of the two, so usually it gets reversed, which is completely unfair, but it's sort of the way it is. Um, so first of all, the idea here of creating periodicity here. So consider my um, transmitted signal here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the uh, odd subcarriers. So let's look at the samples at the output of my um, OFDM uh, transmit structure here. So let's look at W of n here being the sum over n, sum over m equals 0 to n minus 1, s of m, e to j, 2 pi, m, n, let's see here, I'm going to do this for, yeah, n minus l sub c, over n here. So this is our uh, just standard equation for OFDM. The transmitted samples from 0 through n plus l sub c, minus 1 here. 
So now I'm going to suppose that my um, subcarrier, my odd subcarriers are turned off. So what that means is that S1, S3, S5, etc. are all zero. So I can just rewrite this summation here only as a function of the even subcarriers. And supposing I have even and odd, I'm going to also suppose that n is divisible by 2. And I'm going to instead just write this here as 2m. I'm going to write this over here as e to the j 2 pi 2m, n minus L sub c over n here. Now, uh, I'm going to do something tricky, which is I'm going to pull the 2 down. So I'm just going to rewrite this as 1 over n, sum from m equals 0 to n over 2 minus 1, s of 2m, e to the j 2 pi m, n minus l sub c, divided by n over 2. <clears throat> now let's look at the, the properties of this signal here. So we have a 1 over n here. That could easily be 1 over n over 2. We just had a factor of 2. This looks like the Fourier transform of s of 2m of a sequence of length n over 2. It's actually the uh, inverse Fourier transform of said sequence here. And we have a length n over 2 here. So let's look at what that means here. So what it means is that, first of all, we know that w of Let's look at W of LC here. So W of LC would be equal to 1 over N. Sorry, actually, let me um, look instead at W of N plus L sub C for N equal 0 to N over 2. So I get this here, 2M. E to the J, 2 pi M over n over 2. And then now, I'm going to look at w of n plus L sub c plus n over 2. And that's equal to 1 over n, sum from m equals 0 to n over 2 minus 1, s of 2m, e to the j, 2 pi m, n plus n over 2, divided by n over 2. Now, look at this right here. I can split this up into two terms, e to j 2 pi m n over n over 2, times e to j 2 pi m n over 2 divided by n over 2. That cancels, becomes 1. So that's equal to 1 over n, sum from m equals 0 to n over 2 minus 1, s of 2m, e to the j 2 pi m n over n over 2 for and that is the punchline here. So if we look at that here, we've got um, W of n through uh, n plus LC, so getting rid of the cyclic prefix we've got, we create a sequence such that it has periodicity. So what that means is if we turn off the subcarriers here, remember now, now that this W of n is the sampled signal in the time domain here. So this means is that my time domain samples. So this is corresponding to the cyclic prefix. And then this is n over 2. This is n over 2. These are exactly the same. So the punchline here is that we can Turning off subcarriers gives periodicity. To create periodicity in one OFDM symbol.
And by OFDM symbol, I mean this entire block here. So OFDM symbol corresponds to the, um, the vector of symbols that we're sending in one with, with one um, FFT or IFFT. So that's essentially the idea here. And so then, um, you know, generally this approach would work with, uh, let's see here, general K here. So suppose that we turn off every K minus 1 subcarriers. Will lead to a periodicity of of n over k here. So hopefully you can see that from the derivation here, because the more subcarriers we zero, we're going to get m equals zero to n over k here instead of n over two. So we're just going to get a smaller number here, a smaller number here, and we're going to have multiple repetitions of periodicity here. And so you can't turn off arbitrarily different subcarriers. You have to turn off every k minus 1 subcarriage, right? You start at 0 is good, then k minus 1 zeros, then k, then k minus 1 zeros, and so on here. So if you do that in a structured way, you can create an OFDM symbol that's periodic. And then you can use exactly the algorithm we just talked about here to, to do the um, carrier frequency offset estimation. So, let's summarize that here. So let's say apply to OFDM, and I'll look at the special case here of k equals 2, because that's what we just did here with only two replicas here. So with k equals 2, we have this you know, y of n, e to the j, 2 pi, epsilon n, sum from l equals 0 to l, h of l, w of n minus l, plus noise here. And so because of the periodicity, we have that y of n plus l sub c plus capital N over 2 is approximately equal e to the j, 2 pi, epsilon n over 2, y of n plus l sub c. And so looking at the similarity between this and what we just derived, we can say that our frequency offset estimator is the phase of this sum from, and we have to be a little bit careful here. So the way I'm going to write this is because I'm putting the, um, the shifts inside the arguments here, I'm going to write this from 0 to n over 2 minus 1. I'm going to put here y star n plus L sub c plus capital N over 2 times y of n plus L sub c here. Then I'm going to divide the whole thing by 2 pi times n over 2, which is just going to be pi n here. So the main difference between what we've just done here and what we did previously is that before we had um, two training sequences of length nt. And now we have one set of subcarriers, n subcarriers, and we're creating periodicity by turning half of them off. So the periodicity is now n over 2. And so we have n here instead of um, 2n, 2nt that we had before. So let me just write that here. This is n over 2 plus n over 2. And then um, our maximum offset is slightly different. So it's going to be absolute value of epsilon, less than or equal to, let me check the previous one here. Yeah, it should be, before it was 1 over 2 NT, but now it's going to be 1 over 2 times N over 2 is equal to 1 over n here. 
And so uh, the maximum offset that we can correct corresponds to 1 over n. And 1 over n uh, is essentially the, the subcarrier, the discrete time subcarrier spacing with an FFT, right? So that's the spacing of the discrete time sinusoids. So this 1 over n has a very a particular connection with the structure of the OFDM um, signal. And then, um, let's see here. So, now, I'm trying to think, well, yeah, yeah, we have to, we still haven't done the, the Schmidl-Cox piece of all of this here. Okay, so just, uh, actually, just a couple notes here. Um, you know, just same as before, N large gives better um, resistance to noise, but smaller range. And then we can also have k greater than 2. And so we can get more periods to get um, better estimate. and more range. So what they do in 802.11a and its friends that we'll see is that um, they create from one OFDM symbol five repetitions and then another OFDM symbol five repetitions. So that becomes the 10 at the beginning. And then they take one OFDM symbol and effectively repeat it twice and that gives you the next two. Now, there's a little bit of action happening with the cyclic prefix that um, I think I'll explain when we talk about the, the standard itself. But um, there's some games you can play with the cyclic prefix that, that's, that's pretty cool as well. All right, so the unfortunate problem is here. I don't have enough time to finish what I wanted to talk about. Uh, What we'll do next time here is we'll talk about how can we correct uh, larger offsets here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to send um, two OFDM symbols. with uh, different contents, still periodic, and we'll show how we can use that information to derive a larger offset here. So it's going to be effectively like, um, it's called an integer offset correction, because we can show that if you have a larger offset, then you have essentially a multiple of n over 2 plus some residual here. And so that'll create actually shifts of 1 over, of one over n. And so we'll, we'll be able to, it turns out, look at the OFTM signal after the FFT and use that information to figure out how to, how to recover. So that's what I was hoping to get to today, but I think it was too optimistic here um, to get that far. So that's, that's what remains. And that actually is the Schmidl-Cox trick that is involved here. So any questions about this so far here, this extension to OFDM? One thing, important point here also, this is all in the time domain. This is all before the FFT operation at the receiver. So this happens after the filtering, the downsampling. We're going to do frame sync carrier frequency offset estimation, and then discard cyclic prefix, take the FFT, carry on. This is all and done in the time domain so far. Okay, so just to summarize here, so today we've talked about frequency offset, so you should be able to explain what frequency offset is, 
explain why it's uh, hard to fix. And then I talked about the this algorithm for frequency offset estimation. So you should be able to derive this algorithm, explain why it works for frequency offset estimation and frame synchronization. And this you will implement in the lab, so you will have to be able to realize this as well in lab view and apply it to real systems. And then we also had, let's see, where this one here. Similar trick, but for OFDM system, and so you should be able to derive and implement this for OFDM, the key feature being describe how we create periodicity in the OFDM symbol. And then the rest of this, how we correct for larger offsets, I'll defer to the next lecture. All right, that's it. Those of you who are graduate students,